Good morning, Nicole yeah. Myers Turner. Good morning, Elaine Maisner. How are you today? Wonderful. And it's great to be here with you to talk about your brand new book. It was just published in March 2020. The title, Soul Liberty, The Evolution of Black Religious Politics in Post-Emancipation Virginia. Nicole, thank you for spending a few minutes with us to talk about your, your brand new book. Mm -hmm. Thank you so and much for having special, me. And uh, special edition. Of oh, my pleasure. <laughs> and the whole press is, is delighted to be able to feature this in various social media channels. So uh, I wanted to talk about the book and also the, the interesting open access fulcrum edition, which you so interestingly and generously developed with us um, as a kind of experiment. So Nicole, can you tell us a little bit just generally about the significance of, of the work, um, what kinds of contributions it makes, and, and also uh, I know that it's so interwoven with your very interesting uh, digital humanities approach, your methodology. Mm -hmm. Great, yes. Um, so I'm really happy to talk about the book. It is called Soul Liberty. It's the evolution of Black religious politics in post-emancipation Virginia. And the work, the major thrust of the work is about historicizing Black religious politics uh, in the particular post-emancipation period. Um, and by that I mean it sort of tracks how Black churches became or went from being sites of uh, argument making about Black political, partic political participation to being actual sites of political engagement. Um, and this is an important narrative to sort of undertake and to explore because I think there is an assumption about an already or already politically engaged Black church uh, and Black churches. And what this study does is it actually sort of tracks the moments where uh, Black churches were making the case, as in the case of um, uh, some of the Baptist associations after emancipation when um, no black person had the right to vote and certainly black men didn't have the right to vote. They were making the case for black political participation. Yeah, to... if I can just interject, um, I remember being really struck by the, you know, this common wisdom. Yes, black churches are the seat of black politics, you know, mm -hmm. but what does that really mean? And And so I was absolutely intrigued by how you got down to the you know to interrogate that and and to find out uh how you know whether this is true and how it might have actually started mm -hmm. yeah and i think that's what um certainly it's a process of evolving um because initially um like i said black men didn't have the right to vote um, black women didn't have the right to vote. And so in their associations, they make the claims that they actually have the skill. They demonstrate that they have the skill to participate in politics by doing, by the ways that they structured their conventions, mm -hmm. by the decisions that they make collaboratively. Um, and then it really starts to become a moment of um, sort of political engagement uh, after black men get the right to vote. Um, and as black people become more involved in what becomes mm -hmm. essentially the reconstruction moment for Virginia, which was the readjuster movement. Um, and that is where I start to be able to take off and understand how black churches become uh, sites of political mobilization. One of the things that um, sort of was pro prominent in the field and one of the pro predominant interpretations was about the role that um, former Confederate General William Mahone played in uh, mm -hmm. structuring this collaborative movement between poor Black people and poor white soldiers and even some of the white uh, elite in Virginia. So um, Mahone was a Confederate general. Yes, he was a Confederate general. Little who, did he know how important his, his uh, material would be to you. <laughs> well, yes, and, and how important his materials have been to historians. I mean, his archive is voluminous. I mean, it's mm. tens of thousands of boxes of correspondence and all his records. And it's very um, captivating and very, um, you know, one would be really, I, I was even intrigued for a moment to write a little bit about my home because there's just so much. Um, but it also covers over the way that he actually co-opted some of the networks that were built by Black churches. And so that was one of the things that uh, I was able to see through the actual mapping project uh, was to look at how did Black churches and Black communities actually start to form these networks that then would be attractive and ultimately useful in some way to a politician like uh, William Mahone. 
Mm -hmm. um, and so that was, you know, tracking that development across time uh, was really um, the main thrust of the project. And then recording it in a, in a certain kind of uh, way that could be used in, in the enhanced uh, version of the book, which we published through Fulcrum, Fulcrum at the University of Michigan Press. Yes. And so that was one of the interesting pieces of the project, because as I went through this process of mapping um, Black communities, part of the motivation was really because I came across lists of people um, and churches and pastors and post office boxes in the convention minutes and lists of churches and pastors from Mahone's campus. And my initial impulse was to want to see sort of where were these um, churches and where were these communities, where was this network being forged? Um, but it wasn't something that I could easily um, sort of do by hand uh, when I'm talking about looking at conventions across a span of 30 years, four different conventions, um, and then to be able to compare that against um, Mahone's canvas um, and sort of where he gathered his information from. And so that's where I started to do uh, some mapping that really helped me to even better visualize the Black community formation and also the relationship between what Black people understand, understood about their churches and what William Mahone came to understand about those networks. Mm. So what can you tell us a little bit about what it is that you deduced? What did you actually, you know, find out about these, these networks from Black people's points of view and how it fit into the development of the, of the politics of the time? Right. And so one of the things that I was able to deduce um, was really about the strength of those networks and how people mm -hmm. came to understand themselves as part of this Baptist Convention network, as part of this community. And it's something that, you know, you sort of see through uh, mapping conventions across time and, 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 and thinking of it that way. One of the other things, though, that sort of comes out uh, has to do with the way that leadership was viewed, um, that even as these conventions were being built, uh, and as those networks are being built, um, the leaders were oftentimes viewed as reflective of not sort of out, you know, sort of setting the agendas for these communities, which is also something that comes from people gathering together often, gathering in these sort of large meetings of, of, of the conventions. And so they see themselves being uh, the leaders as more representative than, you know, sort of out front leading and creating the I the, see. The and how did uh, women and men interact in this kind of leadership and uh, yeah. development of political consciousness? Yes. And that was one of the other elements that as I was able to track the development of Black church uh, politics across time, I was also able to see how women, Black women, became um, in some sense, uh, marginalized or pushed into, circumscribed or limited into uh, certain, certain roles in the churches. And these roles were, in some sense, powerful roles, right? Women became the sort of central figures in terms of financial um, development in churches, you know, being in charge of uh, fundraising and, and things like that. Um, but they also would have been, were, and continue to be excluded from some of the sort of uh, executive leadership roles or being placed in leadership roles in terms of education um, or in terms of um, things like being on the hospitality committee for the conventions. Um, and part of the reason why I think some of these roles emerged um, had to do with some of the financial capacities of women. So one of the things that I noted was that women were often um, recognized for their sacrificial giving in the convention minutes. Um, and so recognizing that they were giving out of their means, oftentimes not much, right, a meager means, and that became the way of sort of gaining stature and um, recognition within the associations. Um, one of the other things, though, in sort of tracking how, um, how in uh, one particular church congregation, the church dealt with issues around unwed pregnancy became a real notable moment to understand how gender roles and gender dynamics were being constructed around decision-making processes with these cases of unwed pregnancy. And while this case is, I think, uh, representative of a particular context, it also suggests that we should look more broadly at other churches to see how these uh, dynamics were playing out. But nevertheless, what, we, what I found in that was that uh, women were initially able to participate in these um, discipline uh, meetings and, and decision making around cases of unwed pregnancy, but that ultimately uh, is limited or becomes limited because of the church's concern about um, leadership of the minister, because of the church's concern about um, 
the uh, responsibility and the respectability of the, of the church community. Uh, and so in this way, I can sort of track how gender roles also are changing and developing across time in these church associations and churches right. in you know, the broader context of the political transformation right. that was happening. So this project definitely contributes to other fields uh, such as history of women and gen history of gender. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I think it would be great if we could have um, just a, a quick word about the digital humanities mm -hmm. um, and, and your mapping techniques. Mm -hmm. And then maybe we could show, you know, share the screen and show something from the Fulcrum Project in terms of the interactive mapping. Sure. Okay. So, um, and so as I was going through the mapping project, one of the things that I noted was that um, certainly mapping as a technology is one that has been used in a variety of ways to limit and circumscribe Black people's lives. And there's a whole politics around mapping that I could not ignore as I tried to use that same technology to understand something about Black communities. Um, I also know that as I started the research, I was very much interested in how Black people um, how Black people constructed community. This was a project about Black church communities as the foundational element. And so one of the ideas about sort of digital humanities and Black digital humanities is, so digital humanities is the intersection of digital technologies with humanist questions, right? Um, black digital humanities takes um, the imperatives of Black studies around recovery projects, around understanding Black people's lives uh, at the center and at the core of one's research, and also building on these questions of fundamentally, what does it mean to be human? And I take these ideas from Ken Gallen, who made a very powerful argument uh, for the Black digital humanities. Um, and so my project was one that I had to understand the technologies that I was using, but also how could I use these technologies to better illuminate um, Black communities and their sort of um, constructions of knowledge and their understanding. Mm. That's um, very and powerful. Yeah. And I, I also appreciate the, the uh, bringing in of, of the sense of vision, you know, into the actual work of scholarship. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Did, did you want to show um, a map or something? Yes, I definitely would like to show a map. So I'm going to show um, the... Um, Fulcrum page where one of the interactive maps can be found. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to go ahead and share. Okay. And I, I'll mention that the uh, book actually contains, and the website for your book, Soul Liberty, contains a link directly to the Fulcrum Open Access Enhanced uh, Edition. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, and so this is the um, interactive map in the Fulcrum version of the book. Um, where you can see um, in this, when you, when you first uh, open the Fulcrum edition, it looks just like the map that's in the printed version of the book. Um, a flat representation of two layers of a map showing um, one, the outlines of where Mahone conducted his canvas, where he gained his information from, and the other showing the sort of footprint of the different Baptist conventions over that same uh, period of time. But if you click on the interactive map, um, which will take a few, minutes, a few seconds to load, um, but you'll be able to see uh, the same map, okay, slightly visualized slightly differently, but what's uh, important about this is that you can toggle off. So first you see the overlay of the Mahone canvas with the Baptist Association uh, footprint, but if you toggle off, you can see the uh, Baptist Association footprint, which looks pretty uh, robust uh, in terms of the parts of the state that are covered. Um, by these various associations. And um, we can toggle off to see the plain state. And then we can look at Mahone's canvas. And it looks also, right, like, you know, as a, a canvas that covers a significant portion of the state that he would have gained information about um, what churches were present in uh, these various locations. But when you now put them together, you can start to think about, well, what are the places where Mahone's canvas didn't reach, right? And one of the things that we, you can see is that Mahone actually didn't get a lot of information from the tidewater parts of the state, um, that he didn't, you know, he covered a lot of the sort of um, south side portions of the state, but there are some areas where he just didn't get a lot of information. Um, and, and this to me is really indicative of the breadth of what Black church conventions knew about themselves and about their members in comparison to what 
the, the smaller scope of what Mahone understood about those networks, even as he tried to mobilize them. One of the things that um, the map can't show and that I think is also extant and sort of under the layer of the Black Church Conventions is the depth of those conventions, that these meetings happened every year. Um, and that, so we're talking about communities and networks that are built over a decade at this point, uh, over a decade of time, whereas Mahone's canvas was a single, single canvas at a point in time in 1883. And so that's another sort of a nuance to reading the maps that you can get from looking at, you know, these interactive layers of maps. Um, right. That's, that's really fascinating. And the, the enhanced fulcrum edition is chock full of this kind of change over time that you can actually visualize in a different way. So, um, yes. So thank you for showing us that. And, um, you know, I, I, oh, I just wanted to ask you if you could say what the title of the book means to you, Soul Liberty, and um, give, it a, give it a shot. Yes. Um, so Soul Liberty um, is a concept that came out of how the Baptist Church Convention um, people uh, conceived of the work that they were doing in relationship to the establishment of Rhode Island, um, the colony of Rhode Island under Roger Williams and sort of pursuing a Baptist soul liberty. So there's a way in which that term really um, represents how African American Baptist people were situating themselves in the history of Baptist churches. But it's a concept that's a lot broader. It's about how, uh, how African American people were trying to carve out a meaningful um, freedom in the landscape that uh, emancipation brought to them. Uh, and so it's one that uh, applies equally to the Episcopalian folks who I write about who uh, were um, involved in theological education and, and pursuing um, the ability to become priests and leaders uh, and establishing schools. It applies equally to members of the Reform Zion Union Apostolic Church, um, a uh, one of the third uh, uh, the third free black institution, um, the denominational institution created in the South, um, as they were trying to establish their own sort of community and understanding the dynamics of how they might uh, relate to the Episcopal Church, but at the same time remain separate and independent from, uh, in, from that same church. Um, so it's a, a term that is much broader and more reflective of the landscape on which African American people were constructing religious community, were constructing the meanings of freedom, um, for themselves. Yeah. Wonderful. And I, I also appreciate how your study of religion brings uh, U.S. history together with it, you know, because they really are inseparable. And I think that's an important contribution as well. I would say religious history is American history, <laughs> right? Yes. yes. Okay. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, uh, Nicole Myers Turner, for spending some time with us this morning. Great. Well, really thank you so much. It. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks for doing this. I appreciate it. Okay. Bye-bye now. Bye.